Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about immigrating to Australia, driving in Australia, driving professionally and going to university there. And this is the next uh, next part of the story. <laughs> so stick around. We'll be right back with that information, with, with that information, with that story, rather. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test uh, talking to you today about immigrating to Australia, immigrating to another country and living there, working there. And, you know, I had married an Australian, an Australian woman. That's how I ended up there. Amelia uh, was my first wife when we lived in Australia. Uh, the, the first piece of advice that I would give you if you're going to immigrate to another country is to... Uh, visit the country first before you actually decide to move there because when you just pack up your stuff and decide to move there it can be a bit of a daunting experience and I did find that when I moved there so if you're just tuning into the live stream here today uh, let us know where you're tuning in from uh, let us know uh, if you're working towards a class of license how long you've been delayed and those types of things I mean you know we have all kinds of information now about how long it's going to be before they open the economy back up it's like some people are talking 18 months, some people are talking May. <laughs> I hope it's more May than it is 18 months because it's gonna be a little bit nuts. Uh, if it's 18 months, there's no way they're gonna be able to sustain this for another 18 months. Uh, so Ryan is here from Saskatchewan. Matthew's tuning in from Cornell, uh, British Columbia here in uh, Canada. Hallface is from Toronto and Janet is tuning in from Ontario. So we have a few people here. And Wheelman is uh, in Portugal. He's delivering a load, but he didn't think he was going to be able to make it to the live stream today. So, a few people here. So, uh, I was finishing my degree, my undergraduate degree in London, Ontario, at the University of Western Ontario, as I talked about the other day. And my wife and I were going to go back to Australia. I applied for universities in Australia and got accepted to a couple of universities I got accepted to Monash University I got accepted to Deakin I believe and I got accepted to Melbourne and I chose Melbourne just because Melbourne is one of the top universities in Australia uh, next to ANU which is Australian National University and went you know accepted the thing deferred for a year because I was trying to figure out how I was going to go to the University of Melbourne and pay international fees because at the beginning I was an international student as you may or may not know when you're an international student uh, because I didn't have my permanent residency yet uh, that's the first stage of immig immigration to another country is getting your permanent residency and that permanent residency can take a quite a length of time in my case it took almost two years before I got my permanent residency and uh, so when you're not a permanent resident of the country, you're paying international fees and international fees are like 18 or $20,000 a year, depending on you know which country you're in, what university you're going to and those types of things. Uh, hall phase, how long can the economy last before we run into problems? Uh, hall phase, I think we're already into problems. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but the Canadian government is throwing a lot of money at this. So we'll see what happens. Frederick is tuning in from Denmark, Odense, and Billa is tuning in from Oslo, Norway. Awesome. That is really great. So learning about uh, immigrating to other countries. So anybody who wants to drive professionally and move to another country, uh, most of the time uh, when you're immigrating, I'll just talk a little bit about immigration first. You have to go on the country's immigration site and you have to start the application process. And I will tell you right now that that application process is extensive and most of the time you have to be sponsored by somebody to come to a country you can't just show up in a country and immigrate to that country and uh, the country of Australia is very different than it is here in North America and the United States I mean I have had stories about uh, people trying to immigrate to the United States and whatnot it is difficult there is quite a process uh, when I arrived in early two, in the early 2000s in Australia, they were locking refugees up in concentration camps uh, there, and Woomera was one of the most famous of the concentration camps in South Australia. And I can remember that the conditions were horrible, for one thing, because I mean you're locked up and having your civil rights taken away from you, and it got to the point where, in protest, the refugees 
couple of the refugees threw themselves onto razor wire and, and you know, sustained horrible injuries. Some of them killed themselves. Uh, so it was a pretty horrible experience, not to mention the fact that in terms of policing, immigrants and refugees in their country, Australia, is vigilant, to say the least. I mean, uh, it wasn't unlike, it, it was commonplace when I lived there in the summertime for immigration officials to go around to all of the orchards and uh, places where they had agriculture and check people, make sure that they were allowed to be in the country. And if not, they deported them. I had a friend while I was at university, uh, Karen, who overstayed her visa, didn't get her visa renewed, I think by three days. And again, they locked her up. They locked her up and then they deported her. And fortunately, her university professor came and got her and actually got her out of being <laughs> incarcerated because she overstayed her visa. And then after she overstayed her visa and was incarcerated, uh, they sent her a bill for $250 a day for the privilege of being locked up and overstaying her visa. So take immigration seriously when you immigrate to another country. It was easier for me because uh, I was married to an Australian, so it was a little bit easier. However, that is not the end all and be all of being able to immigrate to another country. And you see that all the time that people get married so that they can, one person can immig immigrate to the other person's country. And that doesn't necessarily work uh, because Amelia and I had only been married for less for a year by the time we immigrated to Australia. Uh, it was still rigorous, incredibly rigorous. When we came back to Canada, however, five years later, and we'd been married for five years, and we immigrated into, and Amelia immigrated to Canada, it was much easier. The process was much easier because it was apparent that we didn't just get married for the process of expediting the immigration uh, procedures. So that's one of the things that you need to do. And for all of the people who are in other countries in the world and asking me about truck driving and getting a CDL license here in Canada, the fir your first stop is Canadian immigration. You need to go to the Canadian immigration website. You need to look at what's involved in terms of getting a work visa. And then you, you have to fill out all of the paperwork to be able to do that. Hall phase, when, uh, what I was trying to say was that shutting down the economy for 18 months sounds unrealistic. Hall phase, it is absolutely unrealistic. I totally agree. And my friend Hockey Life is here from Ontario. Awesome. So we got lots of people here uh, today uh, talking about driving in another country and immigrating to another country. Uh, the, in the other interesting thing I can remember, recall this, uh, you have to have papers notarized either by a notary or by a lawyer uh, when I was filling out all the information uh, to go to Australia. So birth certificates had to be notarized, uh, passports had to be notarized, uh, any official document that I was including in my immigration package had to be notarized by a lawyer or a notary. Well, here in Canada, uh, getting documents notarized is expensive. Uh, most lawyers, most notaries are gonna charge you $25 to notarize an official document if you have a copy of it. So if you have a copy, for example, if you have a, a photocopy of your birth certificate and you wanna get that notarized saying that it's an official copy of the government document that you're going to send for immigration or other things, it's $25 per page, right? And I can remember I had like 50 pages, not just in my immigration package, but also in my university applications that I was sending to Australia. So, you know, a couple of lawyers said to me, you know, it was going to be like three or $400 to notarize all these papers. I finally found one lawyer that would notarize them for one set fee of $100, which was very uh, reasonable as opposed to $25 per page, which was an incredible amount of money. But I learned when I went to Australia that you know, to get stuff notarized, there's no cost in Australia. You just go down to the post office or there's a few other public buildings that you just go in and they'll notarize uh, pages for you for no cost. So these are some of the things that you learn the differences of when you move from one country to another country. And my friend Farron is here from South Africa. So we got, we got quite a <laughs> number of people from around the world today here on the live stream talking about working and immigrating to another country. So... Uh, one of the things that I did learn, I hadn't done a whole lot of paperwork for government immigrations at that point. Uh, I learned that I was quite good at filling out uh, government paperwork. <laughs> and, you know, because uh, there are uh, lawyers and other people, other professionals who will charge you money 
uh, to fill out immigration forms and get you into a country and, and, and allow you to immigrate. So, you know, uh, that's what happened. But, uh, you know, as I started out with and I said at the beginning, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, almost the immigration department in Australia was almost bordering on, you know, police state uh, in terms of, you know, how rigorous and how crazy they were. Uh, you know, submitted the application and they said, you cannot contact them. You, you, do, you don't, you can't contact your agent and this and that and whatnot. And it, the story was, is that, you know, this went on for quite a while. And uh, when I first got into Australia, you know, <laughs> Australia is a British colony, as is Canada. And I thought to myself, well, how different can Australia be from Canada? I mean, they're both uh, British colonies. Uh, they're both, uh, it's called a constitutional monarchy. We are a constitutional monarchy. Uh, we are not an independent country. We are still attached to uh, the Queen uh, here in Canada. If we want to, you know, all of our legislation when passed in Parliament has to have royal assent. And royal assent means that it has to be rubber stamped by the Queen. And in Canada, I mean, both Canada and Australia, uh, the representative of the Queen is the Governor General. So the Governor General, when we have legislation that's passed in Parliament, so for example, the relief bill that was just passed in Parliament had to go through the House of Commons, checks and balances. The opposition said, hey, wait a minute, you got some funny stuff in here. You need to uh, amend this. The bill was amended. The bill goes through the House of Commons, passed in the House of Commons, and then it goes to... Uh, What's the next house? <laughs> Somebody can tell me what the next house. There's another house in Parliament. It has to go through that. It'll come to me in it. The House of Senate. The Senate. Right? Uh, it goes through the Senate. The Senate passes it. Generally, when it goes to Senate here in Canada, it's just, again, another rubber stamp. And then the Governor General approves it, and the bill is passed into law. So uh, that's how it happens, and it happens the same in Australia. So, but my point is, is that when I went to Australia, Australia was completely different than Canada. Everything was, you know, kind of the same, but very different. And they talk about this. There's actually a word for it, which I need to look up because I forgot to look it up before the live stream. Uh, when people immigrate to other countries and that assimilation that they go through where they try to get used to being in another country. So it's, uh, you know, and I went through that. And I, you know, but I had studied it. I kind of understood what I was going through, but it was still very different because, you know, all the institutions are there, but they're all slightly different. So, uh, Ryan says, does Australia call their prime minister also, or also, or is it a president? No, it's also a prime minister in, uh, Australia as well, uh, is the leader of the country is the prime minister. Um, uh, but they have states as opposed to provinces. So the state of Victoria, the state of New South Wales, the state of South South, South Australia, uh, the Northwest Territory, Western Australia, and Tasmania. Those are the, I think it's five states and one Australian capital territory, which is, you know, the, it's like Washington, D.C. is a, It's a federal region that none of the states claim to it. And then, but interesting enough, even though Australia has states as opposed to provinces, which what we have here in Canada, uh, the leader of the state is the premier. <laughs> Just to mess with your head a little bit. You know, those, it's those little things that kind of pile up after a while that really kind of drive you crazy uh, when you're in, in another country. Uh, Valerie, hello, my friend. All drivers are welcome. Yes, excellent. All Congratulations to all the truck drivers. Uh, Piracan, what did you study at uni? Uh, I went to university. So, so I just finished the story with... Uh, getting into the country and uh, Amelia and I had saved a fair bit of money when we went to Australia. Uh, here was the, here was the other thing that drove me crazy was Australian banks. Uh, they just drove me nuts. <laughs> so we had, we had a, a bank draft that we took to Australia for $10,000. So we go to Australia and, you know, this is another thing that you learn when you immigrate to another country. So I had a bank draft for $10,000. We took it down to the Australian National Bank. The Australian National Bank takes this bank draft, sends it back to Canada to CT Canada Trust, which was the bank that we were using, which we had the bank draft with. Because we talked to CT Canada Trust before we went to Australia. We said, well, how do we take this money into the country? 
And they said, well, a bank draft is the best way to do it. Okay, so yeah, all right. So we get a bank draft, we go to Australia, we go to the Australian National Bank, they won't cash it, they put it in the post, they send it back to Canada, to CT Canada Trust. CT Canada Trust charges $120 to verify the bank draft, which they recommended that we take to Australia. Then they send it back to Australian National Bank and the bank, Australian National Bank charges another $130 to cash the bank draft of $10,000. So the bank always has their, their hand in the cookie jar. The other thing about the bank that drove me nuts was we were paying our rent at the time with, with a check, right? We, we were giving uh, post-dated checks to the rental company and that's how we were paying our rent. And then I noticed in, the, on our, in our bank account in Australia that there was money coming out every month in addition to the check. And I went to the bank and I said, what is this extra charge? And the, the teller says to me, oh, that's the tax that the Australian government charges you on your checking account. I said, what, what are you talking about? She said, the Australian government charges tax on every check you write. <laughs> of course, you know, at the time, I'm so discombobulated by everything that's going on in Australia, trying to figure out where to buy groceries and, and uh, you know, finances and those types of things. I was just floored. I was like, what? I said, the Australian government goes into my bank account, charges me tax on every check that I write. In addition to writing the check, well, then that became a cash economy. Every month, I would just ride down to the rental company on my bicycle and I would pay them cash because I was just refusing to pay the Australian government tax on checks, which I just thought was absolutely ludicrous. Of course, mo a lot of things that banks do, I just think is ludicrous. It's, you know, it's kind of like this current crisis. You can defer your mortgage, but the, the bank is still charging you interest on this. So the banks are still making money on the mortgage. Actually, the banks are making a lot of money. Uh, a friend of mine in uh, my friend Tim, he has a rental property. He said he called up the bank and deferred the, the mortgage on the property. And he said, oh, it's only going to cost us $3,000. Well, how many people in Canada are deferring their mortgage? Uh, you know, and use $3,000 a person. I mean, the banks are making some pretty good coin on that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Hussein, uh, I just have to say that I have enjoyed every one of your live streams. Great way to pass time. You're a great storyteller. <laughs> Thanks, Hussein. I'm glad you're enjoying them. That's really great. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, so the bank, yes, uh, finally I moved the accounts from the Australian National Bank and we went to, um, oh, what's the name of it? It'll come to me. Bendigo Bank. That's where we went. And, I, you know, I finally got a, around all of that and navigated it. The other thing that I had difficulty with when I first moved to Australia was figuring out food because I came from, from Ontario and when I moved to Australia, uh, the cost of living was probably 30% higher than what it was in Ontario, which was a huge shock. And uh, I had to figure out where to shop. And, uh, you know, you know, you, you learn these things. Uh, same thing some years ago, uh, actually in 2001, when Amelia and I canoed the Missinabie River. Uh, you, the Missinabie River in Ontario, just a little bit of a seg, uh, tangent here. Uh, we canoed the Missinabie River up to Missinabie, and it was one of the major fur trade routes between Lake Superior and James Bay, where they used to load beaver pelts onto the ships, and they sent them back to Europe. And so we got up to this town and we go into the, sh into the grocery store in Mrs. Nabby and bananas are like $5 a pound. This is a time when you could buy bananas for 30 cents a pound in Ontario. And I'm thinking, you know, and everything in the, in the, in the shop is completely overinflated, like to the, to the point where you're just like, how do people live here? And this was a fairly big Northern Ontario community. And so, you know, we were there for a couple of days waiting to go back on the train because that was the only other way. Other, you canoed into, missing, into this town or you took the train in. And uh, so we were there for a day or two waiting for the train to go back. And uh, so we, we were sitting in the restaurant one morning and we were talking to one of the locals and we said, how do you people afford to live here? I said, stuff at the, at the, at the shop there is, is incredibly expensive. I said, like, over-the-top expensive. I said, you couldn't possibly buy that stuff. And she, she kind of chuckled and she said, actually, what we do is we pay the $20 delivery fee and we order it from Cochrane at the other end of the train station and we have it shipped up. 
<laughs> so there's so when you move to another country or places and you find that stuff is incredibly expensive, you figure out ways to kind of get around it. And the way that we figured it out was, you know, there were certain things that we could buy at the grocery store, but most of the shopping that we did uh, for food and essentials and those sorts of things was the Queen Victoria Market. Uh, just as a trivial bit of information here was, uh, the, the Queen Victoria Market is the largest covered market in the Southern Hemisphere. And there's a lot of things in Australia that are largest in the Southern Hemisphere, which was pretty funny. And, uh, you know, I went down there and I met this woman, uh, Gail, and, you know, got friendly with her and chatted her up and those types of things. And she was very enamored by the fact that I was from Canada and whatnot. And, uh, you know, in October once during Thanksgiving, I took her a pumpkin pie. I said, oh, pumpkin pie. And that's certainly not something that they have in Australia or ever tasted, right? So I took her down a pumpkin pie and, uh, you know, I had like 10 pounds of, you know, uh, fruit and vegetables. And she said, oh, you know, that's $3. <laughs> so, you know, you, you figure out how where to buy stuff and those sorts of things. Uh, Epic, uh, speaking of testing heavy, rigid, unrestricted license, uh, is some of these are, yes, yeah, unsynchromesh, different kinds of equipment and those types of things. And uh, yeah, driving on the left side of the road. So that, w that was kind of the story of getting into Australia, getting our money into Australia, setting up. We were living up the back of the house in a separate unit uh, with Amelia's parents, with her mom and her sister. Which, which that had its challenges as well. And uh, so, you know, because I couldn't afford the international fees, my immigration was dragging on when I first got into Australia. What happened was, is that I, I took the course. So I kind of hummed and hawed a little bit, kind of waited, you know, explored trying to figure out how to get into university, how to pay the tuition and those types of things and get started on my degree. And I finally, you know, I took the course, the driving instructor's course there in Australia, which was like way over in the other side of Melbourne. I had to cycle like an hour a day going to this place and do this course. And, you know, I had had a lot of experience already teaching driving and being a driving instructor, read all kinds of manuals, did all kinds of work. I did the course. I wasn't, I wasn't impressed at all with the instructors. There were some things that were just like, wow, really you let that person who's supposed to be an instructor teaching people how to drive uh the the one the kind of the the straw that broke the camel's back for me was uh there was one of the guys in our car so there were three people in our car three of us and one of the guys was a taxi cab driver and uh you know he charged the yellow light and the instructor didn't even say anything to him and i was like oh okay well that's that's not cool because he will not pass a road test if he charges a yellow light with a student or t uh, just kind of lets it go with students so he wasn't very rigorous. And then the last thing that really just stopped me from going the last week, I got my certificate, but I didn't go the last week, was uh, they were in a parking lot and they were blindfolding drivers and getting somebody else to uh, give them instructions on how to drive the car around pylons and those sorts of things. I thought that's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there's so much other stuff that they could be teaching them. So I, 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 I took the course in Australia, but I never actually taught people how to drive when I was in Australia. And so we, we got there in January, and I think I bummed around for a couple, two, three months. Uh, I think it was April, kind of March. So I guess it was two months, you know, about eight weeks that I kind of got assimilated and figured out what I was going to do and those types of things. And I finally decided that I needed a job. And I went and applied for a job as a bus driver with Greyhound. And I got on with them. And I, you know, I got on really well with the manager, Alex, who was there as well some funny stories about driving bus and those types of things and driving bus. Uh, and you know, in the interim before that, I had to get my license back too. Obviously, as you saw my driver's license there, uh, <laughs> my Australian driver's license, uh, for getting my car license back, I just had to go down and write the test, uh, for my truck license though, I had to go down and actually go to a truck driving school and I had to redo the test and I had to take a driving test as well. Uh, so yeah, so and the other difference between uh, truck driving test for, testing for truck driving school in Australia and in Canada, in Canada it's the government that does it or an affiliate of the government. <laughs> Piracan, uh, I wasn't there that day. I just heard about it and I just kind of rolled my eyes and I thought, well, what kind of a goofy exercise is that? Getting people to drive a car blindfolded. I thought, well, what is this? Some sort of Zen experience? <laughs> Didn't work out for me. Um, uh, so 
I went I went down to one of the truck driving schools. I redid my license. Uh, you know, I had to write a couple of tests and those types of things. And the other interesting thing about it is, is that there are certain things in your life that you will do that will cause your brain to not be functioning at full capacity. One of those things is, <laughs> uh, you know, is immigrating to another country, living in another country. The other thing is, is that extreme duress uh, during times of grieving. Uh, and I've had this happen to me twice. Once was when I, I immigrated to Australia. Uh, the other time was when, uh, when the whole divorce thing that went down with my kids and she took the kids away from me and I was just under extreme stress. Uh, I put renters in my house in Australia or in on Vancouver Island where I had a rental property that I sh would have not put in there at any other time in my life. Uh, bricks for wheels. I, uh, Corey, I have no idea what the, I what the idea of that exercise was, but if I was teaching driving instructors, how to, how to, how to teach other people to drive a car, I would never, never do that exercise ever, <laughs> ever. Uh, Ryan, what is your experience attending truck driving school in Australia? Is it kind of the same in Canada or a little different? Uh, it's a little different, Ryan. There isn't the rigorous uh, detail of air brakes. Air brakes is not a separate course in and of itself. Uh, there is a little bit of information about getting a larger vehicle going and stopping a larger vehicle and those types of things. For me to get my truck driving license in Australia, I didn't have to do uh, I didn't have to do a full course. I just had to go down and do a test. So it was a couple of written tests that I had to do. Uh, one of them included some air brake stuff and those types of things. I remember getting a couple of questions wrong that I would not get wrong otherwise because I had been teaching air brakes in Canada. So I knew all about air brakes. Uh, and uh, so I did, I did the test and then they took me out in the truck and took me for a drive. And there were a couple of things that were kind of a little bit different. The uh, glad hand hookups to the trailer were different. Uh, instead of, you know, the one you 90 degrees, meet them up and then push them down, it was actually a compressor connection onto the trailer. So that was a little bit different. Uh, they, got, they had me pulling around a tanker trailer and I hadn't been in a, I hadn't been in a large vehicle on the other side of the road uh, when I got into the truck. But he, it was good because the instructor took me through a kind of a closed circuit area and wanted to figure out whether I could drive the truck or not. And, uh, you know, it was like two minutes in the truck and I'm shifting the truck. And he's like, oh, you, well, you can shift the truck. And I said, yeah. Uh, Robert, were you able to handle driving on the other side of the road? <laughs> I may not get to it today, Robert, but I did have a couple of indiscretions of driving on the other side of the road. And uh, there is a video here, I talk about that, about driving on the other side of the road and whatnot. Driving on the other side of the road really isn't as difficult as people might think. Uh, because all of the pedals, so, so say for example you're driving a manual transmission, all of the pedals are in the same place. So the accelerator's here, brake is here, clutch is here. Same whether you're on the right or left side of the vehicle. Uh, same thing with the steering wheel. The only thing that's different is that you're shifting with your left hand as opposed to your right hand as you would be uh, in a left hand drive car here in uh, North America and other places in the world. So in relative speaking, when you're in the car and you're driving on the other side of the road, you're still in the center of the road. So you're on the right side of the car, but you're on the left side of the road. So you're still sitting relative to the center of the roadway uh, in Australia. And as long as there's traffic around, uh, there's no problem. You just follow the other traffic. So it's not a huge transition uh, when you're actually driving on the other side of the road. Uh, one of the things, Robert, that I did have trouble with uh, when they took me out for the test in the big truck because I didn't have a whole lot of experience at that point. I'd only driven a couple of times in Australia. Uh, he asked me to pull over to the curb <laughs> because I'm in a big truck and I'm sitting on the other side of the truck. My ability to judge kind of where the truck was in space and place I was like five feet from the curb when I pulled over and he's like, oh, that's all right. And the other thing that I did on the road test when we went out, uh, again, I didn't have it very, I had minimal experience with roundabouts because I mean, they didn't start bringing roundabouts back into the driving landscape here in Canada and North America until kind of 2010. So I didn't have any experience with roundabouts and uh, I kind of plowed into the roundabout <laughs> without stopping uh, and making sure it was clear. And uh, I can remember the instructor saying, oh, he says, oh, I didn't really see that. But, uh, you know, that was that was a huge learning curve for me was to figure out how to handle 
roundabouts when I went into Australia. And the other interesting thing about roundabouts uh, in Australia is, is that for most drivers in Australia, when they hit a roundabout, it, that means speed up. That doesn't mean slow down and take your time. It's not like here in Canada where <laughs> you better be prepared to stop when somebody comes up on a roundabout uh, because they do not know how to handle roundabouts here in North America. But in Australia and in Europe, I suspect, uh, it, you know, handling roundabouts. And Farron might be able to answer this question about uh, do they have a lot of roundabouts in South Africa? Uh, and other people here, uh, Denmark, Norway, uh, do you guys have a lot of roundabouts that, you know, is just part and parcel of your driving culture because we don't have a lot of them in North America. As I said, they're beginning to come in, but we don't have a lot of them. Uh, epic driving in Australia seems to be identical to the United States and Canada because individu individual states have their own license categories. For example, New South Wales. Uh, yeah, exactly. Epic. Uh, every the thing about driving and licensing is is it's at the state or province level. It's not. A federal jurisdiction the only thing uh, that I'm aware of that's at the federal jurisdiction is in Canada which is the anomaly is drink driving in a in Canada drink driving is charged under the criminal code of Canada which is federal legislation so it is federal uh, in every other place in the world drink driving is charged under the Highway Traffic Act so in Australia it's charged under the Highway Traffic Act in the United States it's charged under the Highway Traffic Act, so you're not a criminal. That's the difference here in Canada. If you're charged under the Highway Traffic Act or charged for drink driving in Canada, you're a criminal, and you can't travel to other countries and those types of things. So different, very different. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I had a couple of mistakes when I took my truck driving license, but the guy passed me, got my license, and then I went to work for the bus company, and uh, we'll just kind of finish up when I when I started uh, Corey says there's not enough roundabouts in Winnipeg there no there's definitely not I mean we need to have a lot more of them because there are a lot of benefits to roundabouts uh, roundabouts a they move more traffic per hour uh, through an through an intersection uh, they also have less points of conflict so potential points in the intersection where you uh, could potentially crash with another vehicle or another road user and then the third benefit of, ro of roundabouts is that uh, they reduce urban noise pollution because uh, I lived on a corner where there was a stop sign and these big trucks you know the jacked up 350s and the Harley Davidsons that are coming to a complete stop and then they're starting from a dead stop whereas much of the traffic at a roundabout does not have to come to a stop. They simply slow down, go into the into the roundabout, and then go through and make their way through the intersection. So there's less urban noise pollution. So there's a lot of benefits to roundabouts. Uh, Frederick, uh, do you know if it is a glorious life being a trucker for a huge rock act like driving gear for Metallica or Rolling Stones, expensive hotels, good food, or just as tough as anything else? Uh, Frederick, I think... In my experience, people that I've talked to uh, who work for do that kind of work or they move work for movie sets and those types of things, the the bit that gets them <laughs> is the is the waiting, the boredom. Uh, there's a lot of sitting around. Yes, they make good money, but they sit around a lot. Uh, probably 80% of their time is just sitting and waiting and not doing anything. And for them, that's the part that can get really, really boring. So yeah, that you know, it's any job has its perks, you know. And the other thing uh, with these big rock bands and those types of things, you're away from home all the time. Uh, so are you staying in hotels? Are you sleeping in the truck? I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about it, but I do know that you know. I have heard these people that work on movie sets and those types of things. Yes, they make good money. Yes, they're away a lot, and yes, there is a lot of time waiting, and that a lot of people can't handle that. Uh, Lightning, we do have a lot of a lot of roundabouts. I love them very much, and I tend to I agree with you, Farron. I like roundabouts too. I really, really like them. And you know, I'm of the Australian mentality. I see a roundabout, time to speed up. <laughs> and I do have a video here on the channel on roundabouts where I make fun of the roundabout that they made in uh, on Vancouver on Vancouver Island. Uh, at the Victoria International Airport. The Victoria International Airport, uh, if it had been in Europe, what they would have done was they would have put in a big roundabout with five 
spokes off the hub of the roundabout. No, Canadians, you know, Canadian engineers can really mess crap up. And instead of having one big double roundabout, what they did was is they built three roundabouts and an overpass, you know, just to make it expensive. And uh, I'm sure that the engineers had been imbibing for a couple of days when they came up with that plan and thought, oh, this is a great plan. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Victoria, Sydney and that uh, area on Sandwich Peninsula, and I, I talk about this in the roundabout video, uh, it's senior, seniors, drivers. And I mean, Tim from Smart Drive BC, we were talking about this the other day, that uh, seniors have difficulty with road signs identifying road signs the other piece that they have difficulty with is roundabouts and you know we put this goofy roundabout in the center of where senior citizens are it's a very you know uh uh vancouver island victoria sydney all those places on the sandwich peninsula this is the place of the newly wed and the nearly dead <laughs> that's the saying the newly wed and the nearly dead so it's a lot of seniors and it's like almost a daily occurrence in these roundabouts that somebody's driving the wrong way because it's just too confusing. I mean, you know, I know how to do it, but I mean, it's still stupid and confusing. Anyway, uh, Corey, have you experienced sleeper cabins? If that is the correct term, uh, are they decent experience? Uh, so bunks, you're talking about bunks, uh, sleeper bursts on the back of trucks. The newer ones, yes. The older ones, no. Okay, when I drove... Uh, you know, in the winter time, and I talked about, you know, sleeping in Texas where it was, you know, 43 degrees Celsius outside. You got to leave the truck running uh, for the air conditioning unit. It's just, you know, <laughs> otherwise you do, it's like sleeping in a hot box. Uh, you know, in the winter time, you got to leave the truck running. You don't get a lot of heat out of a diesel engine. The newer trucks, uh, the Peterbilt 579 that I drove in 2016 had a separate battery pack that had a heater unit on it and you slept in the truck and I, I, it was like sleeping in a bedroom. I was so impressed. Not sure about air conditioning in the summertime and sleeping in the unit in the summertime, but you gotta remember they're incredibly, uh, incredibly hot. It's a steel box <laughs> with the sun beating down on it, okay? Uh, Janet, I went to Ireland and England in 2015. I could never drive a car over there. Not only do they drive on the opposite side from us, uh, they can parallel park front of car to front of car. Yes, uh, that's the other thing about England and London that is interesting is, is that we have very strict laws here in North America that you cannot park on the other side of the road. So if you're driving down the road, we're on the right side of the road, you've got to park on the right. In England and in London and other places, uh, if you're driving down the road and that you're on the left side of the road and that you see a parking space on the right, you can just park in that space, which is very weird driving in other places in the world. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine <laughs> in England when I stayed in London with him, with uh, Michael. And uh, same thing. He's just like, yeah, there's a parking space. Just park over there. And uh, it was very, very weird <laughs> being able to do that uh, in London. So, yeah. So all kinds of differences in terms of uh, driving culture, the roundabouts, multi-lane roundabouts. Uh, there was a huge roundabout uh, in downtown Melbourne. Uh, where you went out to the northern suburbs and it had traffic lights on it. Uh, it was like, I think it was three lanes. I'll see if I can find a picture for you on Google. Uh, I'll start talking about that tomorrow. But the other thing about Melbourne, Australia, uh, is that you've got trams, streetcars, uh, and streetcars. And uh, motorists since the beginning of time have been racing streetcars in Melbourne to try and get past them because, uh, you know, there's two lanes of traffic going through town uh, and the streetcars or the trams are in the center of the road and every time the tram stops to alight or take on passengers, you have to stop for that goofy tram. <laughs> and, you know, we talked about urban noise pollution and those types of things, but not it's not really pollution. That's the wrong uh, statement when it comes to trams, but the dinging of the bells on the trams is very much part of the Melbourne urban culture and you know you just get there and you just think you hear the trams and the bells as they're going through intersections and those types of things and it's you know it's you're like I'm in Melbourne and it's really awesome so yeah uh fair and I've driven on both sides of the road pretty cool yes it's a very cool experience when you're sitting on the other side of the vehicle I can remember the first time uh that I did sit in a car on a right hand drive uh I was actually in Malaysia when we flew to Australia we went through Malaysia we had a 
fairly lengthy layover in Malaysia. So we, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the city in Malaysia. I can't think of it right now. Uh, we, we hired a car and we went into Malaysia and we got, you know, sat on the other side of the car in the front, which was very weird. And, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun, uh, that we got to go in there and those types of things. So, yeah. So, uh, I'm just going to leave it there for today. Uh, that was a lot of, a lot of stuff about immigrating to Australia and talking about all of that. And uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow about driving for Greyhound and the types of things that I learned driving for Greyhound. Actually, I did quite well and I, I had a lot of fun driving uh, for Greyhound and telling stories on the bus and those types of things. Uh, there's nothing like having a captured audience and having a microphone. <laughs> it's it's not like YouTube where you're you know you're uh, you know struggling for viewership uh, when you've got your microphone and your computer and those types of things. When you're on a bus, they can't go anywhere. Uh, they have to listen to you talk. Uh, but uh, I'd like to think that uh, you know I had some good stories and uh, kept people entertained on the bus rides and those types of things on Greyhound. Uh, Janet, but uh, it was cool to see the transports over there because of, uh, it was different from ours. Uh, is it Australia, New Zealand that has three, four, five trailers? Yes, in the outback of Australia, they do run uh, road trains and they will have three or four trailers, maybe five or six, depending on where they're going and how, how much freight they're hauling and whatnot. Uh, most of the trucks in Australia are the same as our Super Bs here in Western Canada. Uh, the only difference uh, in Australia is, is that the short trailer will be on the front and the long trailer will be on the back. Whereas here in Western Canada, it's the other way around. The, how did I say that? The long trailer's on the front and the short trailer's on the back. So it's kind of reverse. But um, you just type in Australian trucks, uh, transport trucks uh, into Google and you'll see all kinds of pictures of them. And actually, uh, what I can do some of that tomorrow for you. Uh, in terms of looking at some of the trucks and road trains and those types of things uh, when we talk about buses and whatnot. But uh, yeah, so we talked about immigration, those types of things, getting used to that <laughs> and all of that craziness uh, in Australia. So yeah, tomorrow we'll, we'll, we'll talk about driving in Australia, talk, driving professionally for a year and then off to university and other things that I learned. And I'll also look up that immigration term for you. But uh, if any of you are thinking to moving to another country uh, my my counsel to you is to make sure that you go there and visit before you actually <laughs> just end up in another country because it, it can be a very big adjustment to just rock up to another country and just start living there and those types of things uh, so yeah that was that was definitely interesting uh, just living there Sarah my friend how are you so lots of people here but uh, yeah, I'm not sure how long this COVID thing is going to last. I'm hoping that another two weeks that the economy will start uh, opening up and we can start getting people back to the test centers and getting them tested and getting them licenses and those types of things. So uh, yeah, uh, lots of craziness. Excellent. So we'll leave it there. Well, tomorrow I'm going to talk about actually driving for Greyhound. I got some great stories for you about that, breaking down <laughs> trips and meeting people and all kinds of goofiness. And uh, yeah, have a great day. And remember, pick the best answer. Not necessarily the right answer. All the best. Bye now.